So for our first lecture in the course, we're going to be starting off with an introduction to the NEC slash NFBA 70. Uh, in this, we're going to talk a little bit about the code's history, uh, its development, why it came about, um, as well as what its purpose is. Uh, you don't per se need to follow along with this lecture unless you specifically just want to. Um, we're just going to be bouncing around a little bit. Some of it may be hard to follow along physically in your book since we haven't went over how to actually use your code book yet. But again, uh, this is really for more of just an introduction sake. Uh, so starting off, I'm actually going to be switching over to a 2020 version of the NEC here. Uh, since my 2023 PDF doesn't have this page for some reason. Uh, but this will be about the third or fourth page in your book where it actually gives a little bit of the history of the NEC and some of its previous editions. So we can see here that the first version of the code was written in 1897. Uh, this came about as a result of quite a few electrical fires that had happened. Um, at the time, there were approximately five different uh, code gods, none of which had any type of government adoption um, or widespread uh, say-so on one of them being a definitive code. Um, so there really wasn't a dictated standard. So as a result, there were a handful of organizations that came together uh, and essentially meshed the five versions into one code book, uh, that being the 1897 code. Uh, that was then sent out to around 1,200 different individuals for review, uh, and once it was reviewed and approved, it officially became the first uh, version of the NEC. Um, that was written by a group, by one group, uh, who adopted it, essentially, or sponsored it. Uh, in other words, they took it as their uh, responsibility to keep up with it and write it. However, around 1911, uh, NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, decided to uh, adopt it themselves and become the sponsor of the book, meaning it became their responsibility. Uh, so since then, NFPA has had the responsibility of authoring, updating, uh, and publishing the NEC. Uh, the NEC is just one of hundreds of different documents that NFPA currently makes. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 1895-1896, right before the original NEC was actually written, uh, they had just, uh, NFPA had just created NFPA 13, uh, which is the sprinkler code. Um, so that began kind of the code as we now know it with 1911. Since then, you can see down here, uh, there's actually a list in any, every NEC of every version of the NEC that's ever been written. Now, you may notice here starting off from 1897 to 1899, that's a two-year gap, then a two-year gap, and so on and so forth, but it's a little bit sporadic, so we see for instance, 1913 to 1915, a two-year gap. From 1915 to 1918, a three-year, then back to a two, then a three, so on and so forth. And again, uh, these can be a bit all over the place. We see a two-year here, then a one-year, then a one-year, one-year. Uh, and then eventually that changes to 59 to 62, three-year. So there wasn't really any standard on when these would be published uh, or updated. Uh, however, in 1968, uh, it officially became the standard of NFPA that they would uh, publish a three-year version, uh, with the exception being 71 to 75. They had to make a bit of an addendum uh, edit that year, a uh, bit of an issue with sticking to the three-year. But you can see faithfully... Since 75, there has been a three-year release of the NEC every single year, and that's currently what we're on. Uh, as mentioned, this course is based on the 2023 NEC. Uh, prior to that, we had the 20, then the 2017, and then the 2014. Uh, and that's kind of the release history as well as the why it came about history. Moving back to our current day 2023 code, uh, it's grown quite a bit. Uh, 
the original version of the NEC, the very first one released, had just a bit under 40 pages, and we can see now uh, this is over a 900-page document. Um, in addition to that, it was only written by around 12 or so actual individual individuals, 12 to 20, I believe, uh, whereas now there are over 500 people uh, per year who are involved in the creation of the NEC. Uh, if we scroll through our pages here, um, if you're following along in your book, you'll be flipping. Uh, starting on pages right here, 11, this is actually the Code Making Committee. The Code Making Committees are a series of groups. If you pay attention to my bookmarks here, you can actually see there are 18 total of them, as well as a correlating committee who had the essentially responsibility of writing the code. Uh, now, it's a little bit more involved, and we'll see here in a minute, than just, you know, they come up with the rules and they write them. Uh, however, they are ultimately the ones responsible for wording and placing into the code the requirements that are in it. And again, if we were to go through here, you would see there are over 500 members. Uh, the reason there are multiple code-making committee panels, uh, or code-making panels, as they're called, uh, is because if we see here, and we'll learn what this means a little a bit later in one of the later lectures, each code making panel is responsible for a series of articles or sections within the code. You could almost think of these as uh, chapters in a regular book. Um, so, for instance, code making panel number one is responsible for authoring articles 90, 100, 110 as well as these additional chapters and annexes. If we move to code making panel number two, we can see they're responsible for articles 210, 220, uh, as well as some other information in the annexes as well. So essentially, each code making panel is responsible for a group or parts of the NEC, uh, and those all come together in the correlating committee uh, to finish the book. Now, as I had mentioned previously, uh, the code-making panels do not actually come up with the idea for the rules in most cases. Uh, you can actually see, if you go towards the end of your NEC, uh, page 898 here, uh, there is a process by which rules or standards uh, are placed into the NEC, and it begins with what is called public input. Uh, every rule in the NEC actually began as a suggestion by the public. So if we see here in step number one for the input stage, again, this is the sequence of events for standard development process. Very first item is that the input is accepted from the public or other committees for consideration to develop the first draft. Uh, so in other words, without getting into too much detail of every step, uh, the NFPA receives input from the public for suggestions or recommendations for new rules or changes to the NEC. Uh, the code making panels will meet uh, and discuss whether that should be a new rule. Um, if so, how would it be implemented? Kind of the implications of it. Uh, the technical meeting meetings happen in which they go over what the verbiage of it would be. Uh, and there are also standards available on NFPA's website that show uh, how they are technically written, uh, meaning they actually have a standard uh, template of how code rules are written. And once it's made through all of that, uh, it officially becomes a code standard once the new version of the NEC is adopted. Uh, and you can see some of the timelines. Uh, there's a lot of time and consideration that goes into this. Uh, you can further actually see that the NEC gives information on how you can go about making a public input as well. Obviously, now in 2023 and on, uh, we have technology computers to allow us to do this. Most of that happens online. However, there is some other guidelines given on how to do that. And again, we have a bit more information on how uh, the NEC is adopted. So that covers kind of the history uh, as well as uh, how the NEC is developed. Uh, the last item that I wanted to cover 
uh, in this introduction to the NEC, you will actually begin on the first article. And again, we'll discuss in our next lecture a little bit more of the breakdown of articles, chapters, sections, uh, essentially how to navigate the NEC. Um, but I'll, I wanted to point out in this lecture what the intent of the NEC is. And we can actually see this again, if you're following along at this point, would be page 24. Um, let's see that down in this corner, the 24. Uh, article 90, the very first little section here, past the scope, use and application, part A. Uh, the purpose of this code is the practical safeguarding of persons and property from hazards arising from the use of electricity, period. In other words, the entire intent of the NEC is simply to protect people and property from harm, specifically from the result of using electricity. Uh, there's no other reason for its existence. Um, it's not meant to serve any other kind of purpose other than just to protect people and property. Uh, it actually goes on to say it is not intended as a design specification or an instruction manual for untrained persons. Uh, so again, emphasizing this point, uh, the intent of the NEC is not to tell you how to do work in terms of physical execution uh, or a how-to guide or instruction manual. It is entirely for the protection of personnel. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, with the original version of the NEC when it was written, that again came about due to a large number of fires and electrical hazards that were present. Uh, one study at the time showed, for instance, in uh, England, Roughly half, uh, a third to half of the industrial plants in England at the time uh, had electrical fires occur on their property. So again, I uh, can't emphasize enough, the entire purpose of the code is simply for protection of people. Uh, but that's some, that concludes uh, our first introductory lecture here. Again, just going over some of the history of the NEC, uh, how it's developed, uh, as well as its purpose. In our next lecture, uh, we'll get into how to actually use the NEC in terms of how is it broken down. Uh, when we make references to the NEC, how do we know where to go for that reference, uh, and so on and so forth.
So again, that total call out there would at that point be 90.2 C3. Uh, and these can become more and more deep uh, as you move on. So for instance, if we look at this number five here in part D, that would be, we may have a call out that's 90.2 D5B. And again, that can go more and more layers. But again, if I'm making reference or someone else were to tell you to go look, for instance, uh, in uh, section 110.3B, uh, the 110 would tell you to go to article 110, 110.3B, and that would have that. Uh, and that's where you would go to find that call out for the code there. Um, so that, in essence, is again the simple breakdown of how to use and navigate the NEC. Again, we have a top level of chapters, uh, one through nine each chapter being broken down into articles, with each article then being broken down into parts, and again, each article uh, and part having sections there within. Uh, again, for a, a high-level look at that, uh, we would have chapter 1. Since this article begins with a 1, we know it's in chapter 1. Article 110, part 1, Section 110.3b, or for instance, 110.3a2. So again, uh, to summarize, that is our recap of how to use and navigate the NEC and the different terms for callouts. Uh, in our next lecture, we're going to be starting with a dive into Article 90, uh, the introduction to the NEC where we'll be discussing a little bit of what's covered in the NEC, what the NEC does not cover, the implementation of the NEC at the local authority level, uh, and things of that nature.